I said, you've been working for a long time. Well, I spent a lot of my younger days not working. Oh, yeah? Though I started out very strong when I, when I first came out of uh, what you call acting school with Stella Adler. I went right into a Broadway play, and then it all went dry for me for a very long time, and I got lost also in the wild and radical 1960s and drifted away. Oh, okay. Okay. A lot of protest stuff? or I was never went to any of the protests. I was just involved with everything. I don't like group things. I never went to marches or anything that had to do with a lot of people. All of my friends went to the Woodstock Festival. I avoided it because I don't want to hang out with 300,000 people. That was my only reason, actually. I didn't want to get involved in some big scene. So... I haven't lived to regret it. Well, good. So to speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the first time, I, well, the, the earliest appearance I can remember you from was when you were in the opening of Misty Beethoven. Oh, that was a that was a weird, you know, people bring that up. I, some people say, my God, he was in a porn film. Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you something about that, a very funny thing, but... I it, it was somewhere back in the mid seventies or the early like seventy four or something. Somebody I was I was I was like um, hurting for money. I worked very occasionally. I did. I actually was in a movie called uh, the original Death Wish with uh, with Charles Bronson before way before Misty Beethoven. I did that in seventy three, um, and I I also had it done. Tons of theater for years, which people don't know about, way before. Anyhow, I needed some money, and this guy said, there's this woman you can go up to see. She makes porn films. And I said, I really don't think I can deal with that. And he said, well, they have stuff where you don't have to get involved. I went up to see her, and she said, well, I could be a passenger on this airplane without getting involved in the sex and I would have five, they'd give me $500 which was a big piece of change in 74 it's still not a bad piece of change and uh, if I got involved in the sexual things she would give me 1500 which I'd love to have had but I said I don't think I can handle that so I agreed to do and I had one funny little scene that got written up in Playboy yeah, you had the greatest punchline. Yeah, that well, that's film. what they wrote up. The, the, the stewardess or flight attendant now said, you've had two brandies and a blowjob. I said, excuse me, I've only had one brandy and I haven't had my blowjob yet. And that's what they wrote up in. It was a weird scene. It was uh, all done in a, in a flight attendant training plane at Kennedy Airport. The air, the 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 uh, airport had no idea what was going on. It was what's called a closed set. They just thought it was a film, and it was on some level, it was quite. Um, it wasn't a great situation because I had to sit in front of this young guy getting head from this young girl. Neither of them had ever done anything, and he kept blaming her, and they were waiting for a cum shot. And she kept blaming him. And then they tried 60 different ways. They lowered the lights. They put in fewer members of the crew, just the camera operator. And still, then they brought in what's called a professional fluffer, and they got their cum shot. <laughs> and that was uh, They also had the most beautiful catered lunch I've ever seen on a movie set, either in New York or Hollywood. But I didn't touch anything because everybody seemed rather sticky and their fingers were in the food. <laughs> and the women were very beautiful. But when I talked to them, there were like problems. There were like synapse disconnects. There were mm. places where there were big spaces. But years later, I knew a lady named Elżbieta Czyżewska, who was one of Poland's most famous actresses. She had been in films by the director Vida. Mm -hmm. you know, you've heard of him? No, I don't know. Yes. Or what yes, Americans call Wajda, but it's Vida. Right. <laughs> well, she, she was the Marilyn Monroe of Poland, and she uh, married this famous American writer named Halberstrom. Uh, he used to write books about both the Vietnam War and sports. And she came to America. They they were married for eight years. Anyhow, she ended up 
not in great shape, very broke in America. She was a great actress. I worked with her. And she told me one day, she said, she had a friend visiting her. I'm trying to do her accent. She said, I went to the local blockbuster and we were looking for some video to see for the evening. And I saw there was a video about Beethoven. So <laughs> Misty Beethoven. So I took that. She said, not only wasn't it about Beethoven, it was a porn film. Not only was it a porn film, but you were in it. <laughs> so I don't even know. I think I may have seen the film. I don't even know if I ever saw it. And supposedly it was a high, they say it was a better I don't look. I've never seen a lot of porn films. I said uh, the guy who made it. He had he had two names. I think as a as a porn filmmaker, he's known as Henry Paris, and as a regular filmmaker, he's Rad, Ridley, Radley Metzger, I believe, or vice versa. He, he had no. You got it right. Yeah. So he had done some things that weren't porn, but so I made my five hundred bucks and. <laughs> And um, that's that. You've been in so many films. What have been some of the favorite ones that you've done over the years? Uh, my answer is <laughs> is always um, my facetious answer is the ones that have flown me first class to Europe, put me up in a five star hotel in a beautiful European city, and given me great costumes and per diem. But um, like 1492, which no one ever saw. Oh, yeah. A Ridley Scott movie that I think is gorgeous. It's really beautiful. I love doing that. And I, I was in Spain and then Costa Rica. Um, that film got in trouble because there was another... It was right around the 500th anniversary of Columbus's trip to America. And there was another film made with Tom Selleck and Marlon Brando. Uh, the, the, I forget who did it. It was some Israeli producer. And it, it was a piece of shit that bombed, and it opened at the same time and had a similar name. That was that, They were both called 1492, and this one was called 1492 Conquest of Paradise, the one I was... And I think people got confused, since the reviews were so bad for that one, um, they assumed that it, they were one and the same. But favorites um, are actually, I have one scene in a movie called The Thomas Crown Affair that I love. I've always loved it. Uh, a scene with uh, Renee, what's her name? Renee, Renee Russo and, and Dennis whoever. Um, it's a, where I play a famous art forger who's in jail and they come to see me to ask me about a painting. And it's a very witty scene. And I, I it was... Uh, the director was, um, see, I'm losing names, um, John. It was uh, McTiernan, wasn't McTiernan, it? McTiernan, the one that got sent to jail for hiring that detective Pelicano to wiretap people. He did a year in jail, or, which I felt bad about. But I loved working for him. He was a nice director. When uh, people come up and uh, recognize you on the street, these days, what is it for? Is it uh, always Breaking Bad, or do they have other things for you? Hundreds of, for years, it's been Scarface. It never stopped. Ah, yeah. Scarface got, but the last two years, it's been Breaking Bad, nonstop. Occasionally, there's somebody refreshing. Uh, I was I was followed around in. I was working in a film with Daniel Craig in Lithuania, called uh, what the hell was it called? Uh, it was about four brothers that fought back against the Nazis, and I can't even remember that. It was only a few years ago. The one-word title, uh, uh, something with a B. But anyhow, I was I, we were in this town, Vilnius, or Vilnius, the main, the capital of Lithuania, and there were these two teenage kids, boys. I was walking around with my wife, and they followed us block after block after block. And I kept saying to my wife, they're Scarface fans, probably. And they were like about, I don't know, 150 feet from, from me. Um, and then finally, I was standing in front of some theater building looking at a poster. 
and one of them ran across the street and in broken English started saying, pie, pie, you, you do pie. And he was a pie. I love when I run into somebody that's a pie fan because they're usually brighter people. I mean, you know, the ones Scarface, they're always coming up on me with, yo, you still hang out with Al Pacino? <laughs> assumption that if I worked with somebody, I hang out with them. I did another movie with him a couple years ago called Stand Up Guys with him and Chris Walken. But I really hadn't seen him in 30 years except we passed once in an airport. He was very nice with me, but I, I've rarely made long-time friendships in movie work. I have maybe two or three people I know from doing films or TV. I have dozens and dozens of people from theater things. You, you kind of bond with people when you work, rehearse with them for four weeks and then do a play with them for two months. But I was thrilled with these two. These kids were like about 14 or 15 years old and that they recognized me in the middle of their city in Lithuania. Oh, that movie was called Defiance. It was, uh, the brothers were Liev Schreiber and Daniel Craig. I had one scene as the leader of the Jewish ghetto. And uh, because I was the cover set, they were out in the woods for weeks. I, w I only had really one day of work, but they kept me there for three and a half weeks because they saved me for whenever the weather got bad. So I made a nice bundle of money and got to spend three weeks in another country. Not bad at all. No, it was, and it's a, it's a nice movie, and it's a true story. And I, uh, Ed Zwick directed it. I had done a small scene for him in the movie Glory years ago, and I liked working for him. My real question is, did they fly you first class over there? Yes, they they required to fly you either first or business. And I can all, often my manager gets them to fly my wife with me. I had a I did a movie um, in Ireland and Panama called The Tailor of Panama with Jeffrey Rush and Pierce Brosnan, and we did the exteriors in Panama, and all the interiors were done in Ireland because it was a film by John Borman and he has a studio he lives in Ireland. So he did the interiors in outside of Dublin at a place called Ardmore Studios. So they brought us to Ireland. And they what blew my mind was they flew both me and my wife first class on Irish Airlines. And when I looked at the price of the ticket, it was like $15,000 for two round trips. Wow. Movie companies often get those cheaper but it still looked like a great deal of money. Yeah. Uh, wow. Sometimes they get those things with points that they have from using credit cards to buy stuff for the studios. But nevertheless, um, and I've, I've taken her with on about 12 trips to foreign countries. And yes, even if they fly you in the States, if you go more than... I think if you fly more than 800 or 1,000 miles, they have to take you first class. And even when it's a shorter distance, they usually take your business class. But that fucks you up. <laughs> then when I travel on my own, I go by coach. And because I don't want to spend fortunes to just get to California. It spoils you. Also, because not only do they fly you, they have a car pick you up and take you to the airport. You have the ticket all paid for. When you get to the other side, there's a car waiting for you that takes you to a hotel that's already been paid for by them. And there's usually a guy there that gives you per diem money for the next week. So you get really spoiled with that. I mean, uh, that's what I like best about working. Though I've done a lot. Lately, I did uh, three, three different uh, TV shows in New York, and that's all in New York City. I was on Goth. Do you watch Gotham? Uh huh. I was on it a couple of weeks ago as a blind psychic. A a a an episode that took place with a circus, and they introduced the young man who will be the Joker. Oh, nice. Yeah. That show's nicely done. They have gorgeous art artwork. The art design in that show, the art direction, is pretty terrific. I think. Yeah, what else have you been working on lately? I'm on um, 
I'm on Elementary tomorrow night. <laughs> oh, great. With Johnny Lee Miller and, and Lucy Liu. I have two scenes as the CEO of a company that um, puts your body in a cryonic tank and freezes it until such time as science finds a way to revive you back to life. I had fun doing that, and I kind of enjoyed my wife watches the show Elementary. I don't watch it so much. And he, uh, Johnny Lee Miller always seems so bombastically British, but he was a very funny, easy guy to be around and work with. And I enjoyed Lucy Liu, who I have some connection to 25 years ago when she was very young. What did you do with her? I did nothing with her. Um, I had an apartment in L.A. I had been living out there for 10 months. And um, it was an apartment that my son shared with a buddy of his. And when my son went back to New York, I came out and took his place there. And then the young buddy left and went back to New York. And I wanted to give up the apartment. And this kid had left all of his furniture, which he wanted me to get rid of. So I gave it away to various people. And there was a Chinese actress I knew down the block from me. And I gave her a, a bunch of stuff, um, a, among which was some kind of a plant that the kid had left behind, a very beautiful plant. It turns out that that, that Chinese actress was a friend of Lucy Liu's when she was first starting out in L.A., and she gave the plant to Lucy Liu and told her it had been given to her by an actor named Mark Margolis. So she told me that she named the plant Mark and that she still has the plant in her place in L.A. Oh, wow. And though I, I also <laughs> ran into her at um, about uh, when when Noah was about to open up, they had a, uh, a show at an art gallery in Soho of a bunch of paintings people had done of Noah or the Ark. And I ran into Lucy Liu there and spoke to her for a while. Whenever we talk to anybody who was on the TV show Columbo, I always have to ask them, what was it like to be on Columbo? Um, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out which of his eyes was a glass eye. <laughs> um, that's way back. It's about like 1989. Well, by the way, where are you located? In New York or on the West Coast or somewhere? Uh, over in Detroit. Oh, 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 oh. Somebody was just talking to me about coming... There's a guy that brought me to a, uh, I'll get back to Columbo. There's a guy that brought me to an autograph show, which I never went to about a year and a half ago mm -hmm. in New Jersey. And I made a, a, a great deal of money, though. I ended up feeling sleazy because people are paying me money for autographs. There were thousands of people. Um, he just called me yesterday. There's some big autograph show in Detroit at some convention center in May. And he wanted to know if I would be interested to come out there for a weekend in the middle of May. And I said I might. I worked in Detroit years ago at a theater. Rochester. Where's Rochester? Oh, Rochester is a little bit north of the city. Okay, that's where I was. I was at a theater there in the very early 80s, about the time that Reagan was president. In fact, I was there when, he, when somebody tried to shoot him. Um, and I also did a... I did a film there, but I don't think I'm in the film, um, uh, called The Rosary Murders. That was shot in Detroit. I remember they put me in a hotel in something called Greek Town or near Greek Town. I could see across the river to Canada, and I discovered that they have one of the greatest art museums in the world in Detroit. Yeah, yeah. They were in danger of losing it for a little yeah, while. I but it they were gonna, like I'm glad they didn't. They were going to sell off all the assets, which was disgusting. That city will come back. I, we also toured the Upper Peninsula. I also was in Jackson, Michigan. A guy brought me out there to do a play, and he became a good friend of mine. I'm always invited. Uh, he now has a house right outside of Jackson in a place called Clark Lake. He has a big, beautiful house. He always wants me to come out and spend a couple weeks out there. He's a very well-to-do man. It's a beautiful country out there. Yeah, yeah. I've been to Jackson which is not a gorgeous town, but the outskirts where the lake is are, is beautiful. Um, oh, Colombo. Um, first of they're, they're weird in L.A. because that was an I, 
I, I came into, I used to go to LA a lot. I go now when I work and I go out there cause I have grandsons and I get jobs out there. Uh, but there was a period when I'd go out there for three months, six months, 10 months, eight months. And I, uh, my agent, I have an agency out there. My New York agency has an office out there and they wanted me to come out and I got, I was getting off the plane when they called me to go to this audition for Columbo and I got the part and it was as the limo driver in that episode. The, the thing in LA is they never even ask you if you know how to drive. They assume you know how to drive. <laughs> I've known people that have gotten jobs, actors driving, and they don't know how to drive because no one ever asked. Um, the only thing I remember mostly about it is this stretch limo they had me driving was, from my point of view, uh, a half a city block long. And I was a little bit scared about it. I had to drive down some narrow uh, driveways with it to go to the back of this restaurant. I finally learned how to manage it by not thinking of it as a car. Uh, I started thinking of it as a um, as a truck, so I'd make wider turns. Uh. And And there was one day when we first started, we drove out a long distance. And when lunchtime came, they wanted to go back to Universal Studios to have lunch. And the director and Peter Falk and the producer all got into the back of the limo and had me drive them back to the studio since the car had to go back there. And I was I was driving thinking, these, these guys are risking their lives, assuming <laughs> that I know how to drive this fucking thing. I mean, I, w I was just a bit uneasy with it as time went by. Actually, that shoot went a very long time up until near Christmas. They got hung up for some reason. I don't remember what it was. We worked at a big estate at one point. It was owned by, the, the there's a couple of brothers who own the Guess Jeans Company. Um, I loved working with him because I've been a fan of his for since I was a kid. Um, he just passed away, unfortunately. Um, I heard he he had a place in upstate New York where they said he was suffering from a degree of dementia, somewhere beyond Woodstock. And the only other thing that's interesting about Columbo, you know, when you work in a film or a TV show, every night they give you what's called a call sheet, which tells you what scenes they're doing the next day and which scenes are coming first and which actors are working, and what time you'll be picked up. It's called the call sheet. And, and nowadays, they knock them out on a printer. Years ago, they used to do what was called Xeroxing them. And I used to collect paraphernalia from everything I worked in, and I kept little files. Like, I have a lot of paraphernalia from Scarface, uh, maps that show you how to get to Sosa's house. They were, they were for the crew, um, uh, the opening night program from the um, opening night of Scar, the red carpet opening night of Scarface in New York, things like that. Anyhow, <clears throat> there was a guy who's a big Columbo fan who lives in London or somewhere outside of London who uh, wrote me a letter saying that he was interested in purchasing from me any 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 paraphernalia I had from working in the episode of Columbo. And so I went into the file I had, and what I had were four call sheets that were beginning to fade from the years of sitting around as a Xerox, uh, you know, copy. I had those, the four call sheets and one continuity picture, a Polaroid at that time that the wardrobe department took to, to just keep continuity of my costume, and I asked them to take a picture of me, and they gave me one copy. So I told him I had the four call sheets and the, uh, the, 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 the continuity photo, and he asked me what kind of money I wanted for it, and just off the top of my head, I said $400. And he, sa he, he sent me through PayPal $400 for the... I could have even copied those call sheets and kept them as another set to sell. I gave them to him, 
but I, I mean, I have, if, if that's the case, I have stuff from Scarface that I could probably sell for $15,000. I have a, a satin jacket that says Scarface on the back with my name on the front. I always assume I could sell it to some uh, hip hop star for $10,000 because they're crazy about Scarface. And I have a lot of others. I mean, I have the original script of Scarface that I used with some notes of mine. I have a lot of stuff I kept from Breaking Bad. But I don't know what, do you want to know anything about Columbo? I, 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 I always love listening to him because he has that, he has what's called, I think it's called a glottal L, where he can't say words like lady. He says, lady, lady, <laughs> lady, I just want to go back and look under your bed for a minute. I, I just want to check one more time. He's got, he's an interesting, you know, he's a, he's like a Lower East Side New York guy, um, Peter Falk. I think he, his real name was like something Falkenstein. He was always a marvelous actor. I always dug him in everything he did. He did a lot of John Cassavetes movies. He he and uh, Ben Gazzara, they were in things like Husbands Together, and then he did movies with Cassavetes' wife, Jenna Rowland. Um, I've always been a big fan of his. Yeah, I always liked when uh, those guys would show up on the Columbo episodes. It's like, oh, that's kind of cool. People I did, all kind of give them back. Did, did, did Ben Gazzara show up on Columbo episodes or, or, or Cassavetes? Cassavetes, definitely. He was in one called uh, Etude in Black, where he was a um, a conductor who murdered his wife, I believe. Or, or it was a woman that was getting too close to him. And then uh, Gazzara, I can't remember if Gazzara was on him, but I know he directed a bunch of them. Well, you know, you're you're probably much younger than me, I assume. A little bit, a couple uh, years. All right. When I was young... The first way we knew Cassavetes was he was an actor before he was a director. Do you know that? Yeah, I remember him in, uh, okay, what was that, the Palma movie he was in? That, uh, I'm not sure, but he, he he had a series on TV in the 50s called Johnny Staccato. And he was an actor who, as a kid, I thought he was as good as Brando. He was a marvelous, unusual, uh, very moody, kind of a pensive creature. In fact, I was kind of upset when he gave up acting for directing. And then I, I actually later, I worked in a, a, a series on TV in the late, about somewhere about 1988, there was a series called Quantum Leap. And Nick Cassavetes, his son was an actor in it also. Nick became a director now. He's done some big movies. But at that time, he was an actor. I also was hired to work in a Cassavetes movie called Gloria years ago. But the scene doesn't exist. I've named about three things that don't exist anymore. He, he, he improvised the scene. Um, it was a, he, he had me and two other actors come to his hotel room at midnight to audition for the part in this thing. And then we went into the hotel where he showed, we were waiting outside. He showed up about 10 after midnight. And then he said we had to be very quiet because Jenna was inside sleeping because she was the star of the movie. And then when we went inside, he said, he said, you know, I, I really don't like auditioning people. Can we just like, I'll, I'll take some straws out of the broom and we can pick straws or whoever gets the shortest piece of paper gets the part. And I said, okay. And one of the guys said, I don't want to do it that way. So he read each of us and he gave all of us a part. He created parts for all three because he can't make a decision that way. So. <laughs> um, but then the scene doesn't exist in the movie at all. I still get residuals from it. When I worked for him, he wasn't a lot of fun to work for. He, he was absolutely out of his mind, frantic. He was like somebody... Uh, he was almost like a speeder. He he was saying this, he was saying that. He'd come up at you and say, I'll tell a terrific joke. <laughs> wow. Right off the top of your head. Um, I, he was very um, on edge, uh, kind of terse. Um, it, it wasn't the happiest experience of my life, though. I mean, it wasn't just me. He was this way with everybody. So... 
I was just rewatching uh, the Cotton Club the other day, and I was so glad to see you show up. I like that. That was uh, that's another insanity. Uh, they they spent three days with a black cat from Animal Talent Scouts. Uh, the two of us come in to kill those guys. The other actor who really thought he was like one of the world's greatest actors, maybe he is, I never heard of him again. He came from Hollywood, his, the one that accompanied me. His name is Blackie Decker, like the, like the tool company Black and Decker. Right. It's a catchy name. Yeah. He was really full of himself. He was not the problem, though. Uh, Coppola wanted a black cat to walk in front of us in this bar on 23rd Street as we come in and they could not get this black cat to cross our path. And I swear to you, this went on for two or three days. <laughs> he could not get what he wanted. Finally, they, and they must've been paying the cat handler a thousand dollars a day for the cat. And they tried another cat. They finally got, there was a cat in the kitchen of the bar and they got that cat on the third day to walk in front of us as we went. <laughs> in. And, I was carrying what's called the Thompson submachine gun, which weighs about 35 pounds. It, which is, they, they joke about the fact that that's why in those 1930s and 40s gangster movies, that's why the gangsters always shot the gun out, you know, out the back window of a Hudson automobile because they were too heavy to carry the fucking gun. So this gun weighed a ton. And I knew nothing about machine guns, though the armaments guy showed me how to use it. And a couple of times uh, when I was firing it, the gun jammed and Coppola went berserk on me saying, I thought you're supposed to be some kind of a fucking gun expert. And I said, I, I was, I, I, I'm just an actor. I'm not, a, you know, so I didn't really like him. <laughs> I, I don't know why he dumped on me you know I, 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 the guy who produced the film Fred Roos I think was his name I had worked for him several times and he had worked with Coppola a lot I think he hired me um, I didn't know I, I had never really met Coppola I, I guess Roos told him I was a gun expert or something I, I enjoyed doing it uh, a, a year or two later, Coppola was doing some other movie and Roos brought me up to meet him. And he said, uh, I remember him. It was an embarrassing thing. He said, uh, he said, you remember Mark Margolis and Coppola said, no, I don't know who the fuck he is. And I, I, I think I'd have walked out of the place. It was just too harsh. Though, granted, he's a terrific director. It has nothing to do with the way he was feeling that day. Most of the people I've worked with have not been like that. I, I've not run into that where I had to put up with somebody's. And Cotton Club's a wonderful movie, I think. It's a pretty good movie. I don't know. Yeah. Seeing, um, oh, shoot, why am I blanking on the guy's name? Because you're getting old. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Seen, the guy who was a dancer, Gregory Hines. Yeah. Seen Gregory Hines yeah, he and his died, brother dancer. He really died way, way too young. Oh, yeah. He was terrific. Yeah. Yeah. So was uh, what's, uh, uh, Fish, Larry Fishburne in it. Mm -hmm. he, yeah. He dunked the guy's head in a toilet bowl. I've run into him <laughs> in L.A. He's a funny guy. He yeah, had, he's we had me call him Coppola. Fish. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was saying he's worked a ton with Coppola ever since he was, what, 15 years he old? In in, he did a, 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 supposedly he was 14. Oh, God. My son did an episode of The Equalizer with him. I was a recurrent on The Equalizer. My son worked on it once and did a show where uh, when, when Fishburne was still working in television. Well, he's back to television now. Um, but uh, it was about uh, skinhead racists and, and uh, folks of color. And my son uh, got friendly with him. He, he is. A, he had asked me about my son when I ran into him in L.A. Oh, that's great. Yeah. You were on Hannibal, weren't you? Yes, because Ridley likes me. But what Ridley really wanted, from because of 1492, I was the sniffer of the perfume. But the odd thing was that Ridley, at that time, Darren had only made the movie Pie, 
And Ridley kept picking my brain to ask me questions about pi, on and on and on. And right after that, Ridley produced this series called Numbers, which Darren calls it Hollywood Pi. <laughs> well, it, it was somewhat a ripoff of Pi in some ways, not directly, but it, it had connections to Pi. And they thought that some of the things that uh, Ridley was asking me about Pi uh, helped him put together numbers. I don't remember what he asked me. But I, he's a nice man to work for. I liked working for him. I also liked working for De Palma and Scarface, though he almost never said anything to me the whole time we worked. I never could tell whether he liked me, hated me, or didn't even know I was there. He did a bit in... Um... Dress to Kill, too, right? That was, boy, they say a bit. It was, it was a, uh, this is going back to the days when I was still doing, uh, when I did the porn film. Uh, there was like $150 a day to make as an extra. I was basically an extra in a long line of extras walking in an asylum. Yeah. But people have noticed me in it, which is surprising. Even when I did extras, I did good work. Well, yeah, it was. It's always nice when you show up and stuff. It's kind of like a little breath of fresh air for I, me. I don't know why people say that to me, and yet, truth be told, I dislike my work. I'd say in fourteen out of every fifteen things I do. Oh wow! And my son always runs a big critique, saying I'm doing too much. I didn't have to do that. Da da da. Why'd you do that? I don't know. I don't usually like my work, really. I've liked it in a few things. But then again, it, it may be, you know, when you listen to your own voice on a tape recording, although they don't have tape anymore, do they? When you play back your own voice, it always sounds like, oh, God, is that the way I speak? Do I have that kind of an accent? Oh, fuck, that sounds horrible. You know how you feel when you hear your own voice? Uh, I don't know that all the people, time. Huh? I said, I feel that all the time. So that may be what's happening when I see myself. I've run into actors who don't even look at their own work. Supposedly, Brando never wanted to see things that he was in. Maybe for that reason, I don't know. I never worked with him, so I don't know what his reasons are. But he never wanted to see the work he had done. Uh, somebody once told me that uh, Mickey Rourke never saw The Wrestler. I worked with him three times. The wrestler, some weird fucking thing in Canada called the Mortals. Oh was, yeah, was, I just watched that over the weekend. All he did was set me on fire. I was actually doing Breaking Bad, and they wanted me to come up to Canada because they didn't like the way Immortals had come out, and they were adding scenes, and they wanted to add me into it as a priest who get who he sets on fire. Mm -hmm. And what was the th I did a third thing with him. I can't even remember what it was. He's a weird creature, but I like him. Yeah, when he's on, man, he can do some great work. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he just fucked up his face. That's the problem. Yeah. He was a very God. beautiful young guy. I don't know what the fuck that's all about. Yeah. No, I, I just rewatched uh, Rumblefish, and he was absolutely gorgeous in that. Yeah, and also in, in uh, nine and a half weeks, he's very oh, beautiful. Oh, yeah. And yeah. also, wasn't he in Once Upon a Time in America? No, I mean, that's not it. The Diner. He was in The Diner. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a terrific one, too. Funny, I was um, way back when they were doing The Diner, there was a casting lady who had cast me in a couple of TV things or movies. I don't remember which. And uh, what's his name? Levinson. Barry Levinson directed it. And I think that was one of his first films, The Diner. And this casting lady needed somebody to read with the actors he was auditioning, which agents usually frown on you doing that because then you get known as a reader. But she offered me a couple hundred dollars for the day, and I needed it. So I went and did it. And, w and the funny th the thing I remember was that there was a guy, I don't know who he was, he was not an actor. He was some kind of a rock musician who had some notoriety. And Levinson was crazy about him. And the guy was giving horrible readings. And Levinson worked with him for like 45 minutes trying to get a good reading out of him. Over and over and over. And I was reading the other part with him. And um, 
Then I read with uh, Kevin Bacon, who he didn't seem to pay much attention to. And, and eventually he gave the part to Kevin Bacon, but I couldn't understand why he was so hung up on this fucking uh, rock singer who looked a bit like Buddy Holly. Um, it was just a weird experience that he was so hung up on this guy, and yet Kevin Bacon, who was incredible in his reading, he didn't pay much attention to. Directors are, you know, I don't know how they pick and choose what they pick and choose. There are a lot of different reasons or whatever. Why? Well, thank you so much for your time tonight. This has been great I talking to you. Probably bored you to death. No, no, this is terrific. I could it, literally, I could sit here for another few hours and just pick your so brain about what stuff. Happen, what happens when it's a podcast? What does that mean? It goes on the internet. Yep, yep. So this thing runs. I think the second week. No, first. It's actually it goes up April first. And uh, uh, when we post it, I'll send you a link. But yeah, it's, you can download it via the internet, or some people I have won't stuff like set up on their my phone. Own, I won't like hearing my <laughs> own voice out here because I grew up in Philadelphia. I've been gone since I was nineteen, but I hear traces of my Philly. I have a slight twinge of Philly, which is an awful effeminate sound. Um, works better on women, and 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 even if I you if you forget to write to me. Somebody will tweet on Twitter that, oh, I heard Mark Margolis on, uh, what's your show called? The Projection Booth. The Projection Booth. Um, what should be so lucky. Are you a filmmaker or were you? did you go to a film school or you're, you're, you're a film critic or what? Uh, went to uh, U of M for a film degree, but it's much more of a, more like a the film U of criticism. M is the University of, of Michigan. Of Michigan? Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I did I did a radio uh, broadcast from uh, the University of Michigan at what's the famous place uh, with an A? Uh, Ann Arbor. Yeah, I went there when I was doing this play. We were promoting it. We went on this radio show in Ann Arbor. I had a pleasant time. Um, but you listen. Let me close with the most important thing, which is the worst part of me. I don't go to the movies very often. I used to, when I was young in the 60s, I went to all the great foreign filmmakers, you know, like uh, 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 Antonioni and, and Kurosawa and, and, uh, and, and Fellini and on and on and on, uh, the great French directors. I, I wearied of it, so I probably go to a movie once a year. Um, the only thing I saw this past year in the movie theaters was Birdman. I see some of them on TV. I also don't watch much TV. So people say to me, you're an actor and you don't go to movies or watch television. I say, well, I'm the equivalent of a heroin dealer. I sell the stuff. I don't use it. Right. <laughs> Which I always thought was a cute line. It's a good line. So, yeah, I'll listen to your podcast. All right. Um, give, give my regards to Detroit. <laughs> Will do. Hey, if you come in for that show, let me know. When I was there years ago, and it was very depressed, people used to see when we were up in Rochester, we'd be, uh, when we were going to go into t to Detroit, people would say, the city is so tough, there are guys standing on the corner chewing on bricks. <laughs> so look for that. Will do. All right. <laughs> All right, you have a good Take night. Care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All righty. Bye-bye.